Anyone who believes in indefinite growth on a physically finite planet is either mad or an economist. We don't want to focus politics on a notion that involves the rejection of principles around which a large majority of our fellow citizens organize their lives. We are not as endlessly manipulable and as predictable as you would think. How is it possible that the Chinese were able to reap the benefits of globalization, a process that we in the West created, uh, and we on the other hand seems that we're going from one major crisis to the next? So what went wrong? And I think the answer was given by Martin Wolf uh, of the Financial Times uh, recently when he said, you know, the great Western anomaly is over. We're facing a new system, and we got to adapt to this system. Maybe there is something we can take from the Chinese experience in order to make our system much better. So I'm going to start this lecture with uh, something that's been with us, uh, unfortunately, for the last two years, which is the Euro crisis. So at the last G20, um, the Chinese were asked to help. So to come to the rescue of uh, the euro, uh, to bail out uh, Europe from this situation. In the last few days, we've seen that um, in uh, bilateral meetings between the EU and the Chinese, uh, the, um, the Chinese have expressed interest in helping uh, Europe. But the key issue is that the Chinese are not going to help Europe if Europe does not help itself. So un unless we produce um, a policy of economic growth, uh, it's going to be very, very difficult. Then the Chinese you know, will actually come to the rescue. And one of the arguments that's been used in order to convince us that the Chinese eventually will rescue us is that China is very much dependent upon international trade. Um, so a contraction of the world economy produced by collapse of the euro will, of course, you know, trigger a major global recession, and the Chinese will be hit. So mm, uh, the Chinese, uh, in fact, uh, and this is uh, mm, I interesting, uh, I think, is the fact that they do not trust the Europeans, because so far the Europeans have done very little to show that they have a plan, a long-term plan, in order to sustain growth. The Italian and the Spanish banks have been given by their government um, uh, a sort of you know, state stamp for what uh, concerns their bonds. So they issue bonds which have the guarantee of their own countries. You may say, well, you know, these are countries very close to default, so who is going to buy them? Well. Actually, the ECB is buying these bonds. Yes, offer this long-term repurchase offer for bonds up to three years, which has been flooding, literally flooding, you know, the banking system. What these banks are doing with this money are actually exchanging the bonds in for money. Then they use the money to buy the government bonds of their own governments, sustaining their debt. And this is why you have seen that all of a sudden the spread between uh, um, the Germans and the Italian and the Spanish government bonds has actually come down. The truth is <laughs> that these are money which are printed by the European Central Bank, uh, which are given to the um, banking system of um, Italy and Spain, which are then uh, used to purchase this debt. And then once you know, these bonds uh, from the government are purchased by the banks, the banks go back to the ECB and exchange them for money, and then the, it starts all over again. This is a Ponzi scheme. I think because of this, uh, it is highly unlikely that we're going to see China stepping in and help uh, in, in real terms uh, the situation in Europe. I think you know the two things that uh, the Chinese can actually teach are, are flexibility and pragmatism. Now, it's interesting to see the background of Deng Xiaoping, very different from Mao. Um, they were both founders of the Communist Party, but um, Mao never left China. Deng Xiaoping spent a long time studying in France. He also worked uh, at the Renault factory in, um, in France. So he actually had uh, a first-hand uh, understanding and knowledge of the capitalist system. Also, Deng Xiaoping was purged uh, during the Cultural Revolution. 
So he spent those years um, um, at home uh, studying um, how to adapt the communist system to the needs of a world economy that was increasingly becoming capitalism. So the key question was, can capitalism actually save socialism in China? And this is exactly what he did. So when he came to power, he started the process uh, of liberalization, especially in um, agriculture. So farmers were allowed to sell part of their products um, separately from the state market. Um, the idea was to introduce progressively a two-tier price market, whereby eventually you know, the state control pricing could be uh, removed and a market um, system of pricing could be um, take place. Um, unfortunately, this policy produced inflation. With the liberalization system, um, they had, the, thanks to being, had to reduce uh, uh, the social welfare system which had been in place uh, uh, since uh, you know, Mao uh, took power, which means basically everybody had a job, everybody had a home, and everybody had a bowl of rice to eat every day. So um, these two phenomena created uh, rising social tension, which eventually ended up in Tiananmen Square. So contrary to what um, many people have written, um, Tiananmen Square was not uh, a protest to achieve democracy as it was happening in Eastern Europe uh, and in the Soviet Union. It was actually a protest against a transformation system uh, which was not going fast enough uh, for people that, of course, were supporting the liberalization. And mm, they was going too fast for people that did not want uh, that process of liberalization and wanted to maintain uh, the security that was given by a communist system. So um, what Deng Xiaoping did uh, uh, facing this situation uh, 10 years after he started this process of liberalization is what I define as the unthinkable. He actually repressed with violence uh, the protest. He did that uh, in order to go back to the drawing board uh, and basically rethink uh, the process of liberalization. But clearly, it had not worked uh, the way he wanted. Um, but also, he did it because uh, the opposition, the internal opposition from the party, coming from both the right and the left, uh, was so strong uh, that the only way to regain control of the situation was actually to repress Tiananmen, to repress the protest, uh, and then fight back inside the party to gain the trust, uh, yet again, and produce a new economic plan. For two years, basically, uh, what Deng Xiaoping was, was to consolidate his position, to convince the, re the right and the left wing of the parties that the program of liberalization was the only hope to maintain communists in China. And then when he managed to get this support, uh, he changed completely the program. So instead of uh, liberalizing the agricultural economy all in one go, the decision was to try to experiment uh, in the special economic zones. So the special economic zones um, became a sort of enclaves uh, where Deng Xiaoping reproduced uh, the condition of the Industrial Revolution so that capital could be attracted. Because the key issue in China was China did not have any money to modernize and industrialize. It did not have the funds coming from the West, the Eastern Europe and the Soviet Union had. So one way or another, China had to attract foreign capitals. And the only way to do that was to offer industrialists, foreign industrialists, uh, conditions that they could not have in their own countries. And these conditions are you know, low cost of production. So on one hand, uh, um, in these enclaves, uh, um, the rules the, of Western capitalism uh, were applied, uh, but they went even beyond that. So people could do basically whatever they wanted. But the real important resource that the Chinese had in order to attract this capital was cheap labor, endless, endless amount of cheap labor. What Deng Xiaoping did was uh, to 
produce a new legislation to introduce mobility of labor. Under the Maori system, people born in the countryside uh, were bound to live in the countryside and work in the countryside, and people born in the cities uh, were exactly in the same position. So what Deng Xiaoping did was he freed people. He gave them the possibility to migrate uh, from the countryside uh, to the special economic zones uh, and to become workers uh, in the newly constructed fa factories. Uh, if you think about this is the script of the Industrial Revolution with the enclosures. Now, you may say uh, exploitation, absolutely. There was massive exploitation. Uh, but the key issue here is not so much exploitation as opportunities. Those migrant workers uh, were given an opportunity that their parents never had uh, under Mao. They actually had the chance to save some money, to come back home and start a new business or go somewhere else and do and start a business. Uh, now, Deng Xiaoping gave uh, the opportunity to people to exploit, but as we have seen, the Chinese did not have the money to start um, factories. So money started to come from uh, the Chinese diaspora, so Taiwan, Malaysia, but also from the West. And Apple, I think, is one of the best examples of how uh, the vision of Steve Jobs um, to give all of us a virtual life actually could be implemented within a decade thanks to the sweatshops of China. Without those sweatshops, the iPod would not have cost $200, and therefore not everybody in the world could have had the opportunity to buy one. Now, this is the model of the Industrial Revolution. I mean, Deng Xiaoping did not invent anything. He adapted, though that's the key issue, capitalism to communism and communism to capitalism. If we look at what is happening in Europe with the Euro crisis, uh, we are rehearsing an old script. We're doing the same thing we were doing in the 1990s. What we need here is something new. That requires stepping out uh, of finance into the domain of the real economy, which I don't think that the Europeans are ready. But above all, that requires thinking outside the box, what Steve Jobs did and what Deng Xiaoping did. And that's what we need, politicians like that, not like the one we have today. Margaret Thatcher is very um, uh, trendy again at the moment. And I can recall when the, when the Berlin Wall fell uh, and before then, her mantra was, and Reagan's mantra for that matter, was that you cannot have free market economics on the one hand without free peoples and free democracy. You, you have to have both. What does China's exper recent experience show is it that um, do they have free markets, even if they have capitalism? Mm. And, does it, and does that prove or disprove Margaret Thatcher's axiom that you cannot have a free economy without a free people? I think Margaret Thatcher w was wrong because there is not one system that fits them all. Mm. Um, economics is not uh, an exact science. It is a social science. So mm, you need to adapt it to the circumstances. Um, what Ma Margaret Thatcher did uh, at that time, uh, it worked uh, uh, in the short term, but you know, the, the consequences uh, of that policy, we're still paying them today. Mm. I think uh, that um, we can have any kind of system. Absolutely. I mean, you can have an undemocratic system uh, uh, where the economy is free, as you know, we can have a democratic system where the economy is not free. I mean, look at the situation in Greece, for example. Um, uh, people are not allowed to say what they really want. I mean, the elite doesn't want the election, mm. although, you know, the <laughs> They should have election within the next 12 months. The European Union doesn't want the election because they're afraid that the Greek will vote against this austerity and they will vote in favor of getting out of the euro. So uh, what, is this, what is democracy? Is democracy really the will of the people or is democracy is, you know, the leader who tells the people what is good for them? Well, if this is democracy, then China also has democracy. 
we've talked a little bit about whether China's progress is politically sustainable without democracy as we know it, uh, but also whether there's a question mark about whether it's sustainable economically. Because if a lot of it is um, to do with the Chinese lending the Americans more and more money to buy more and more Chinese goods, that's what the economists call the global imbalance, the big mm -hmm. global imbalance in the world economically. And it got us into the mess we did now. And it also occurs to me that a lot of what people are saying now about China and its massive export drive and its determination to succeed and, and its untapped potential and all this stuff is, is very much what they were saying about the Japanese in about 1986, just before it went pop. And they had the longest recession um, uh, in their history probably and one of the longest recessions in anyone's history. Um, and when there was a lot of talk and films and novels and stuff mm -hmm. about the Japanese 21st century taking over, buying everything in America, they bought the Rockefeller Center, the, the land in the Emperor's Garden was supposed to be worth more than all the real estate in California. And yet, where are they now? Actually, they're still exporting, they still have a surplus, mm. but they're, they're pretty much done for. So I just wonder if you could tell us what you think the, you know, given the fact, as I say, mm -hmm. it's quite a short time the Chinese have made this progress, whether it's actually sustainable, whether, or whether it's hype, really. Uh, well, um, I think, you know, judging from uh, the Chinese history and also the, the way the Chinese look at themselves, uh, I would say that uh, China doesn't need the word uh, as much as, you know, the word needs China. Now, we're talking about 1.3 billion people, potentially, Really, China could develop an internal market uh, that, uh, that is, you know, twice uh, as big as uh, the European and the American market put together. Mm. So, do they need the word? I don't think so. I think what they do need from the word is not so much as selling their products as, you know, getting the resources. So, the mm, dependency uh, will turn around. I, and I think, you know, probably will turn around in the next decade uh, with this new leadership. Uh, um, so more than uh, pushing export, uh, they will uh, try to secure strategic uh, markets for imports. Uh, mm. um, and I think that's where we have to look at. And they're already moving, you know, in that direction. Africa, Australia, and now they're starting with Canada. Mm. Uh, so you can see they are positioning themselves uh, there. So I think that's the main difference between Japan and China.